thank you all for being here, and especially the United Nations Watch uh, for this opportunity. Uh, when I told my parents uh, I was being invited to the United Nations Watch uh, to speak about uh, the authorities' attempt to abduct me, they strongly advised against it. A friend warned that by coming here and speaking today, I was being loud, and Pakistani authorities do not like loud people. Another colleague said that I should be careful because at the end of the day, I have to live in Pakistan. All this is true, but I have one response. I am doing this for all of us. I tell my family, friends, and colleagues that recently they came for me. Tomorrow they may come for any of you, and it will continue until one day there is no one left to speak the truth. But before that happens, I want to ensure that I did everything in my power to fight for our right of freedom of speech. To an outsider, it may seem that there is democracy in Pakistan and civilian government is in charge, but it's sort of a facade uh, because the military really runs uh, the power and, and runs sort of a shadow government. It may also seem that the media in Pakistan is quite vibrant and independent, especially because it has sort of freedom when it comes to reporting on government and political parties. But if you scratch the surface, you, you will discover that taboo topics, uh, there are taboo topics and self-censorship is the norm. Such taboo subjects include the Pakistan military and religion, particularly Islam. Challenges of this, these topics rarely survive, be it an individual or a news organization. Over 100 Pakistani journalists have been killed in Pakistan in the last 15 years. Dozens more have been beaten, kidnapped, or threatened into silence. While there are non-state threats, they're usually linked to state apparatus in some way. For example, when Geo News, Pakistan's leading news channel, accused the intelligence services of orchestrating an attack on one of its journalists, the channel was forcibly closed down on blasphemy charges, and a religious lobby was activated to punish the network. Pakistan's army mostly uses intimidation tactics to silence the press. They also use financial incentives to motivate news organizations. Thus, news organizations constantly run propaganda fed to them by the military, including songs, videos, and news. All this has created a militarized society that the army then uses for its strategic purposes, for example, to justify its own expensive presence or interference in matters which they should not be involved in, for example, domestic politics or regional conflicts. For the last 12 years, I have been reporting on military affairs, including military human rights abuses, the business empire they run, and the political manipulations they're involved in. The running joke amongst my friends back, in, uh, back at home in Islamabad was that they would take a photo with me in usual social gatherings and say that perhaps this was the last time uh, they, this, this photo was being taken with me. And finally, in May 2017, my fears were realized when the Pakistan's Federal Investigation Agency ordered my arrest over charges they've yet to inform me about. Insiders tell me that Pakistan Army's intelligence agency is behind this move. I thus approached the court through the late Asma Jahangir, who offered to fight my case. The courts ordered the agency to back down, and I resumed my work. But the courts did not stop them. On 10th January, just about six weeks ago, I was on my way to the airport in Islamabad when armed men stopped my taxi and tried to take me away. I would have gone missing if I had not escaped, but given the presence of mind I had at that time and their mistake, I jumped out of an unlocked door and ran for my life, managing to get to a nearby police station. The police have failed to find a single trace of my would-be abductors who stole my passport, my electronic equipment, and other belongings. The cameras in the area were not working, 
except for the taxi driver who was taking me to the airport and a girl on her way to her university, no one has come forward to, as an eyewitness, even though this happened in broad daylight on one of the main highways of Islamabad uh, at 8.30 a.m. in the morning. The day it happened after that, I filed a police case and I told my investigation officers that I will see them soon whenever the culprits are ca uh, caught. And they just laughed at my face. Uh, the police in charge in Islamabad say that those who tried to take me away were quite intelligent as they left no clues. I told them that the word he's looking for is not intelligent, but intelligence agencies. Just before my failed abduction, I was in the city of Lahore where a peace activist, Raza Khan, had gone missing, and another journalist, Zeenat Shahzadi, who had been missing for two years, had recently returned, but disappeared from public. I was investigating both these cases and had conducted interviews, but my attackers took away all the material that I was to send that day to my head office for broadcasting. For over two months now, Raza has been missing, and his only crime was bringing Pakistani and Indian youth together on a platform called aghaz e dosti which means start of friendship. In the last year alone, dozens of similar cases have been reported where journalists, activists, and social media users have been beaten up or picked up from central Pakistan, from mainstream Pakistan, unlike previous cases which were reported from Balochistan province or from the tribal belt. In many countries, such dissidents are imprisoned. In Pakistan, they go missing, and they are even denied the recognition of being political prisoners. The common theme among all these cases is that the victims were vocal about issues that the military wants to control. For example, Pakistan-India relations, military policy of security in the country, the military's role beyond its mandate in areas like politics and business. And in response to our words that can never harm anyone, they have tried to silence us with violence. I have chosen the pen as my weapon, and they have responded with guns. I truly believe that evil does not prevail, and I have done nothing wrong but to exercise my freedom of speech. This, it is this conviction that makes me continue to, uh, that continue, makes me, mo that motivates me, and I have temporarily relocated myself uh, to Europe because of safety concerns. And I'm living with my family in Paris nowadays, but without a proper job and without a proper home. I packed my bags, and living out of a suitcase is not easy, but I decided that there was no way I was going to compromise on my freedom of speech and hence, I could temporarily compromise on my residence in Pakistan. And therefore, I have been currently living in exile since the last week and do not know when it will be safe to return back. Nevertheless, I will ensure that I will continue to raise a voice for the rights of Pakistani public, and that is why I am here today. I urge fellow diplomats, officials, and activists here who believe in the same values I do to call out the Pakistan army. Following my attack, the US government was the only government to issue condemnation publicly. Pakistan has many international partners, and especially they have economic and trade relations with them. It is time that foreign countries should deal, not put their values at the expense of their monetary interests. It is time that Together, we dissidents from inside the country and you from outside the country can pressure the military to stop such practices which have no place in a pluralistic, democratic, and progressive Pakistan that we all want to see. Thank you.